I guess I can keep the announcements short since you guys have been here all weekend. You know, usually announcements for people who aren't uh, really plugged in. But if you are... Buy VIP, raffle tickets. And yes, and if you are a VIP and you haven't had your VIP meal yet, then uh, you've got it today at lunchtime. If you don't know where to go, please see me. I'll let you know. Um, besides that, I'm going to do uh, the intro of our esteemed panel host. And he can tell you about our wonderful guests here on the 2014 edition of the Secession panel. It almost didn't happen happen um you know like to change up the panels if possible from year to year not all of them but the secession panel was sort of in the the queue of options for well if we need another panel we could do this but uh rob matthias was so excited about hosting this panel he really wanted to do it and i thought well i i've been looking for this because i reached out to some other folks in the secession community and it was it was kind of difficult to get a response and rob took this ran with it and i think has assembled an amazing panel uh he of course is the host of the Rebel Love Show and uh, up to half a year's worth of episodes at this point. So congratulations on that. Welcome to Keenvention. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, now, secession is usually a dirty word that a lot of people use um, in regards to like the Civil War and like the racist South and whatnot. Um, I would never use it in regards to uh, outreach to other people, but for this situation, I'm, I'm speaking to other activists, I'm speaking to other liberty-minded folk, and honestly, I wouldn't mind taking the word back, um, personally, because it really does fit the uh, ideology of what it means for independence uh, in regards to a smaller area, a geographical area, leaving an empire. Um, that being said, uh, secession's really, uh, it means a lot to me, because with secession, I don't agree with like the state even existing, but you know what? At the end of the day, if New Hampshire can declare independence, that gets sort of like 80% of the tyranny in my life, and I'll support any endeavor to at least minimize the amount of tyranny in my life by doing so. Um, so, uh, let's get this show started. Uh, the panelists I have up here, I have uh, Daryl Perry of uh, Free Press Publications and the New Hampshire Liberty Party. Uh, I have Lauren Rumpler of Objectivist Girl. I have Jason Sorens, who honestly you don't need an introduction. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you don't. Um, and then uh, Conan Salada of uh, Black Sheep Probably. Rising and also New Hampshire Liberty Party. So, um, the big agenda that I really want to do with this, I don't want to discuss why uh, secession, secession. Um, now we can discuss whether or not New Hampshire should or not, but the big reason that I want uh, to talk is I don't want to go through discussing why there should, why we're even having this panel. Um, I don't think that's even needed. I, what I would like to talk about, uh, big, big two things really, is the impact uh, of the Scotland secession vote on the Western world and what we can do to promote uh, independence and secession, uh, not just here in New Hampshire, but throughout the world. Uh, so first question I'm gonna ask all the panelists, um, Scotland, uh, how has it impacted this, you know, the, the secessionist movement, the liberty movement? Uh, what role did that event play uh, going forward? So I, I guess I'll start. Obviously, the Scottish independence vote for people that paid attention, it wasn't actually a vote for real freedom because the Scots that were behind the vote that got it actually put on the ballot were sort of socialist, uh, self-avowed, not my label applied to them. But at the time that the British Parliament, the whole of the British Parliament, was deciding to put this on the ballot, the leader of the Scottish Independence Party asked for a third option. And not a lot of people know this. He asked for an option of what they called devolution which is essentially more autonomy. And the British government at the time said, no, we are not giving you a third option. You can either stay or go. And then there were the debates leading up to the vote. And as you know, the guy, Alex Salmond, who's the, or was the leader of the Scottish Independence Party, 
really kicked the ass of the guy that was like, you have to stay part of the queen because history. And so then, because the Brits realized, oh, well, we might actually lose Scotland, they decided to, you know what, if you guys vote no, we'll give you more autonomy. And Alex Salmon did a really good job of saying, hey, wait a second, I asked for that three years ago, and you said that was not going to be an option for us. And looking at the exit polls, there were enough people that were, you know, swayed by the if you vote no, we'll give you more autonomy, where it was 25% of the people that voted no said that that's the reason is because, well, they said that we would get more autonomy. And that was enough of the vote to where even if only half of those people would have voted yes, Scotland would be independent or would be on the path to independence. So I guess it's really a twofold question of, you know, Scotland independence in the entire discussion of secessionist movements and making people realize that lines on a map can be rearranged and a question about actually getting true independence, not just leaving one empire to create another. Um, <clears throat> so you and I were on Free Talk Live and got to talk for three hours about secession and it was amazing because this was the night um, where they were supposed to have the vote and um, <clears throat> it was just one of those, it was in the air. Every caller wanted to talk about it. It was completely on the table and that's really the point in the whole thing is that um, I, it would have been great to see Scotland secede um, because it would have proven the point that secession can work. Um, there were, I believe it was uh, 14 states who separated from the Soviet Union peacefully. And that's one of the things we talked about on the show. And if you can secede from the Soviet Union peacefully, you can secede from anybody peacefully. Because the Soviet Union, we don't need to go into that. Everybody knows uh, how bad the Soviet Union is. Um, or was. was. It was. Uh, so anyway, um, so the point is, is that Scotland uh, showed that that you can handle it in a peaceful way, um, and that um, and that it's important to um, to be considering these kinds of ideas. And I think that um, the fact that they did this so publicly, because you know, when North Korea and South Korea separated, it most people didn't weren't paying attention. This was so public, this was so huge, and I think that we're gonna see more things like this, and I think that it's gonna push people closer and closer to the idea of secession, and I think that it's completely possible here if we just, um, if, if they behave the way that Scotland did about it. They really were classy about it. Um, and it's just unfortunate that they didn't get the majority that they needed. Yeah, so I think uh, there are three lessons that um, libertarians can take from Scotland. Uh, the first is that, um, as Daryl noted, um, secession doesn't always increase freedom. Uh, so our judgment of secession should be based on what we expect the consequences of it to be. In Scotland, secession would have, at least in the short and medium run, meant less freedom for Scotland because it would have meant uh, bigger welfare state, higher taxes, more business regulation, things like that, at, at least. Maybe some more freedom on some other dimensions and when we get rid of nuclear missiles and things like that. Um, but second, I also agree with Lauren that, uh, that the really interesting lesson about Scotland is that uh, you can support um, a, a right to secede, a peaceful, a legal procedure for secession without necessarily endorsing secession. And that position is much more popular, this idea that, well, the people in that place should have the right to decide their own political fate. You can't just force people to be part of a political union. You can't force people to be part of a political union. <laughs> okay. Good. It's okay, you're loud. I'm sure they can hear you. <laughs> I don't, yeah, the, yeah, the recording can't. So the, the right to decide is a big uh, uh, benefit um, of, the, of the Scottish vote. It shows that, um, uh, that, that people are willing to, uh, to, uh, to agree with the proposition 
that it should be up to the people in a particular territory to decide what their own political status, what their own political fate will be. And, uh, and that has powerful ramif ramifications for other countries. Uh, in Spain, for instance, the, the Catalan secessionist movement has been able to say, hey, look, Spanish government, look what the British government did. They let Scotland vote, and guess what? They, they voted no. You know, you can just let us have this, this right to decide. And, and the Spanish government's been intransigent, saying we're going to arrest you if you try to hold this vote. And uh, so we'll see what happens there. But what's interesting is that in Catalonia, about 80% of Catalans support the right to decide. Um, and support for independence is lower, somewhere like 55%. So... Um, that's an issue that you can use, right? This, this issue of the right to decide is a kind of wedge issue that you can use to get a lot of people on your side, at least on that front, who might not otherwise be on your side. And, and having that right to decide, I think, helps even if you don't exercise it, because you can at least say to the federal government, uh, hey, if, uh, if you don't agree to give us more autonomy, if, if you don't you know, actually respect the, the Constitution, the Tenth Amendment, things like that, um, then we have this right, we can leave. So there is a kind of sanction that we can apply to you. And then the third lesson that I think um, libertarians can take from Scotland is that uh, is about what, what are the political conditions necessary for secession? Secession's difficult in these sort of well-established kind of democratic countries, you might say, um, because people are reluctant to make a big move from the status quo. So there's a lot of uh, risk aversion out there. And we saw that in, in Quebec and their two referendums that, that both failed. Um, the polls tended to overstate support for independence. You know, when it actually came down to voting, fewer people supported it than the polls suggested. And that happened in Scotland as well. Um, I think Catalonia, if they actually were allowed to vote, would, would in fact vote for independence. Um, so that would be an interesting precedent. But we have to be aware that, um, that voters have this kind of aversion to uncertainty. And if you're trying to promote secession, you've got to deal with that in some way. You've got to address voters' insecurities and, and show them um, one of two things, or preferably both. Show them that independence is not so risky, not so uncertain after all, that there are significant benefits to getting there. Uh, and second, maybe that not seceding is the risky thing, that the status quo actually is unstable and things will actually continue to get worse and we're going to continue to be exploited if, uh, if we don't actually take this move. And I, th I think, again, in, in Catalonia, they've, they've got that argument to make that the Spanish state is going to... Um, keep aggressing against them and taking away their rights uh, unless they make this move to independence now. Uh, Jason, I think in your second point, you brought up a, an excellent point, and that is that what, what has happened in Scotland uh, is really, I think, going to get the ball rolling for, you know, for the rest of the globe. Um, in our lifetimes, I know this, has happened, this happens throughout history. It's a rinse and repeat uh, kind of scenario. But uh, I haven't seen anything. You hear places like Jefferson or even in Florida right now, they're having some silly little, um, the, the north of Florida is uh, not green enough for us and that we want to secede. So you have lots of silly secessionists out there. You have the tinfoil hat wearers and you have the politicos and, uh, but Scotland didn't flip any cars or smash any pumpkins or any of that nonsense. They uh, kept, it, <laughs> kept it peaceful and, uh, and they showed that uh, a large portion uh, are good to go with this idea that uh, even if they are getting into another kettle of fish uh, down the road, and, may, and maybe some of them aren't actually even sure what is, what they're going to get into. I mean, they at least they are uh, um, you know moving on, and they're not stuck in this uh, this old idea that uh, um, you know th the safety net. I think the safety net is the biggest the biggest issue, and uh, the biggest reason why people aren't able to step away from uh, you know the powers that be uh, they're afraid they've got they've got their lives ahead of them they've got uh, met, they got they got bills to pay they got kids to, to raise and so i think and we're gonna, not going to talk a whole lot of why we want to secede but i think it's very important um uh, to you know what we'll find alternatives uh as far as the safety net is concerned and to wake people up to the idea that for a lot of us 
uh, for my generation, that safety net's not going to be there. So why continue to fund the cancer? Um, it's, it's really is time to uh, step away, and, and I think step away to the smallest uh, uh, increment uh, that you can get to. In my, in my case, it's this community here in Keene. I would be perfectly happy seceding from New Hampshire as well. Um, but, <laughs> Rob, I'm going to get what I can get. So, yeah. if it, so if it takes, uh, if it takes joining up with Vermont, the hippies that I love so much. I would love to work with Vermont. Yeah, it's yeah. I would love to see Vermont, New Hampshire, even Maine all secede at the same time, have a whole block. You better believe it. The yeah. union. But I mean, yeah, so that's, if that's all I can get, then I'm, I'll be happy to go with that. But I would love, uh, you know, just to, just to be keen. Um, you know, this, this uh, I like to be able to, to, to have a conversation with the guys who are, uh, you know, supposedly representing me. And if they give me a hard time, you know, I got their telephone number. Whereas some guy in Concord, I don't, I don't know these people, but at least I know where my mayor lives. And if he, if he, if he gives us the runaround, um, you know, pumping's going to get smashed. Do you mind if I make a two sure, quick go. points? Um, Jason, I really like the third thing you said, um, and that's really uh, what is important to me. So um, I think that um, a lot of people are of the opinion that we are safer um, staying in the state that we're in instead of um, becoming independent because they're afraid of the ramifications, worst case scenario. So say it does turn violent. Uh, the reality of the thing is that in the history of violence that we've had to endure under the current regime, it's, it, it can't compare to the violence that we would have to deal with if, if, it, if things turn bloody. It's just, it's, and the history of staying with them. I mean, people are dying every day in the streets from police, um, e police Ebola. brutality. And it is ugly and sad. And I think that people need to understand that there's a difference between their fears and reality. And the reality is that people are dying every day and we are not any safer being under a government um, than we would be rebelling against them. So um, it's just, it, that's the reality of the thing and, and that's one of the things we talked about. Well, those, and those are good stats that you, know, that you need to feed to the people. Like look, you are right. more likely to, eight times more likely to die from, from your law enforcement officer than you are a terrorist. Uh, you're not going to die from Ebola because it's probably not even real. Um, the terrorists have their own uh, problems. They're not concerned with you, and it's not, they're not here, you know, breaking, uh, uh, crashing into your buildings because of our freedom. So you don't, you don't have to worry about it. In this. It, it it's all nonsense. Um, Lauren, the governments uh, throughout history are pretty much responsible for uh, all of the horrific uh, uh, Catastrophe that that has that if you open up the history books, you know, if you leap between their lines and you get down to the bottom of it, it's all because of uh, people wanting to control other people. Agreed, and, and, they, it's and about they use and they use government. That, yeah. It's about spreading that reality and and actually uh, telling people, reminding people that it's just the fear in your head. This is not the reality. Statistically, you know, people are more likely to die from the police than they are from the secession. Because, well, Soviet Union is a great example. So I've just got one point before we go to the next question. And I'm glad you asked about Scotland, but like in the midst of everybody answering. Off. Go ahead. I, I uh, thought about another secession vote that was a lot less hyped. And that was the vote in Puerto Rico, where they actually did a two-step vote Question one was, do you want to change the political status that you have? And then question two asked, statehood, independence, or independence in free association with the U.S., which would give them a status similar to what Micronesia has. And I actually take credit for that, and I'll explain that later. All righty. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, no, my whole thing with uh, Scotland is that uh, even though they didn't obviously win that vote, 
they uh, they put out the idea that it's actually acceptable for a Western power to break away peacefully and to actually have that discussion to choose uh, the people of that landmass who they want uh, in power, uh, whether a far off land or something near, closer. Um, I think that uh, before, like a lot of times, secessionist talk was like, again, tinfoil hat stuff, or like you, you're talking about, like you know, in this country, there's still the whole racist aspect of it from the Civil War. Tea partiers. Tea partiers, yeah. Um, but this is, you know, this is Scotland we're talking about, and they, it happened. Uh, the vote happened, and it wasn't really uh, a question of that they can't. It was oh, the whole time leading up to it was like, will they actually? pass this vote and that was something that I felt like that was a huge impact on secession movements around the world because that allowed it gave us kind of a, not legit well, yeah a legitimacy um, it didn't make it look like that we want a violent revolution that we just don't want to, it's just voicing our, your your opinion that you don't want to be controlled by these other people um, so that being said Scotland they got this vote and now they had to have a lot of support in Scotland, uh, to not like the majority support, obviously, but enough support to actually get this going. Um, that being said, uh, what did they do in Scotland to really build up that culture? And uh, what, what can we take away that was really successful in how they built up that culture? Well, I would say that it's been something that you know, and I, I'm sure that some people are going to say that I'm using the true Scotsman fallacy here. But, you know, there, there's the history of Scotland wanting to be independent or the Scot people wanting to be independent and not under the thumb of England. And it's something that, you know, they remember that, hey, at one time, Scotland was a completely separate country. It was in 1707 when there was this official uh, act of union that consolidated England and Scotland, even though they shared a king or a queen for, you know, some hundred and some odd years. But it's sort of brought up in their culture of, hey, remember, one day you know, Scotland will be free. And if you don't want Scotland to be free, you're not a true Scot. And so it's something that's always been ingrained in them. And I think that once they were allowed to actually express an opinion, the people that wanted to be independent and knew that, hey, you know, this is something that my grandfather dreamed of, it could actually happen. They were more motivated to go out and try to convince the people that were kind of on the fence of, I don't know, independence might be kind of scary. Like, you know, they're saying we can't use the pound anymore. Screw the pound. Screw the Federal Reserve note. You know, like, figure it out when you get there. But just remember, in 1775 and in 1776, when our great-great-great-grandfathers were saying, you know, we don't really want to be part of England anymore. You know, maybe Washington, D.C. has become England, and we don't want to be part of England anymore. Um, throughout history, new ideas have always been um, controversial, to say the least. Uh, this isn't a new idea, but I think that the way that Scotland handled this was very um, mature. And I, I know I talked during the ladies panel about um, a uh, be an adult movement. And uh, I, th I think that Scotland really, really, really handled this as adults. They were, you know, they actually used their words instead of, you know, hurt people. Um, you know, it's about having an actual intellectual discussion about these ideas and um, and, and Scotland did that, and I think that's a real cue that we need to take from Scotland, is that you can do this in a peaceful manner, like adults, and you don't have to ride in the streets and hurt people. Um, there is a peaceful way to handle disputes. And um, I think that, personally, if, if we worked on our, um, on what we do as a free market approach to criminal actual crime. I, I really think that 
secession is going to grow in the minds of every individual. It's really the biggest question is how are we going to handle crime? And, um, and I think that we're moving towards a state with, with Bitcoin and with other technologies, we're moving towards a state where we can be independent. I think Scotland recognized this uh, faster than uh, a lot of other places. And I think as technology grows, you're gonna see more people trying to secede. And um, I, I, I think really ultimately comes down to just handling things with class and educating people on the current technology that you have and the abilities that you have. And I think that the Scottish people really just were extremely classy about the whole thing. So. So the Scottish National Party was founded in the early 1930s, and from its birth it favored independence, but it was always a really small party. Um, it's basically like the Libertarian Party here. It'd get 1%, 2%, maybe 3% in elections. But, but at then, least in England they have consistent ballot access rules that allow them to actually be on the ballot. True. Uh, that's right. And so it was, it was easy for parties to get on the ballot, but most of them, you know, the, the Labor Party and the Conservatives dominated politics after World War II for, for a couple of decades. And then in the late 60s, something started happening. In, the, in every Western country except the United States, uh, there was this process of de-alignment as uh, voters started dropping out of supporting the, the big left and right parties, and, and new parties started to form and gain support. And in England, that was reflected in growing vote shares for the Liberal Party, now the Liberal Democratic Party. And in Scotland and in Wales, it was reflected in um, growing vote shares for the Scottish National Party and Blight Gimry, the, uh, the Welsh uh, uh, Nationalist Party. And then what happened to really sort of take this to the next level is that oil was discovered in the North Sea. And the SNP campaigned in the uh, first um, 1974 election on the slogan, it's Scotland's oil. And right, we, we now have uh, the revenues needed for independence. Uh, let's not let England take all the revenues from our oil. And they won 30% of the Scottish vote in the Westminster election on that platform, which I think is still a record to this day. Uh, they've gotten close to that, but I don't think they've ever surpassed that in Westminster elections. So there was, a, there was big support for them, and then it, it, it fell back during the late 70s. There was uh, a lot of um, economic problems, malaise. You know, the, uh, the Labor Party lost power to, to Thatcher's conservatives in, in 79, and the Scottish National Party dropped back. And kind of this issue got off the, um, the front burner, sort of um, uh, fell back in, in Scott's consciousness. But then through the 80s, the Scots, who are well to the left of the rest of Britain, got really angry at, at Thatcher's conservative government and the policies they were pursuing, um, the most infamous of which was the so-called poll tax that was implemented in Scotland before it was implemented in the rest of the UK, and there was a lot of civil disobedience against that. And support for independence started to grow, and even some Labour Party members started supporting independence, um, although the, their official position remained devolution. Now we want devolution for Scotland. Devolution had to wait until the Labour Party won power in 97, uh, and then they implemented it. And what they tried to do was to set up the, the electoral system in the Scottish Parliament in such a way that the, the nationalists could never win a majority. So they set up a proportional electoral system that they thought would mean, well, the nationalists are going to get 30% of the vote, they'll get 30% of the seats, they'll never be able to form the Scottish government, we're never going to have a referendum. Um, but uh, the Labour Party so mismanaged things, the Scottish National Party was so successful in, uh, in campaigning and kind of getting their message across that, um, that they did win. Um, first, they won a plurality of seats. They won something like 44% of the vote and close to a majority of seats, not quite a majority, but, uh, but they were able to form a minority administration. And then they did win an absolute majority of seats. Uh, in 2011, and at that point they said, we're going to hold a referendum on independence. So how did Scotland get to that point? I think it, um, it started off being oil and the benefits of, of independence, um, but then it became over time much more about ideology and we can implement our own kind of society, which is why um, I predict that New Hampshire will eventually, uh, let's say 30 to 60 years from now, will eventually have a significant secessionist movement because New Hampshire is becoming more and more ideologically distinctive from the rest of, of the United States. Now, the one thing New Hampshire doesn't have, which I think is a necessary 
prerequisite for any significant secessionist movement is a national identity. And Daryl mentions this as kind of the big thing that you know, there was a Scottish national identity that goes back hundreds of years. We don't have that in New Hampshire. People think of themselves as Americans. Right? State identities don't seem to trump national, you know, national or American identities, your state identity, so to speak, uh, you, you know, United States identity. Um, so as a first step before we get there, there needs to be a kind of um, collective New Hampshire identity. And I don't support New Hampshire secession, actually. I support New Hampshire self-government, I like to call it. Uh, you know, I, th I, I think, hey, if we, if we can control all our own criminal policies, all our own economic policies, and that sort of thing. The feds will I'm never that. let that happen. <laughs> Well, if they, won't, if they won't let that happen, they probably won't let independence happen either. Um, but we'll see. I, uh, here's, my, here's, my, uh, here's my pitch on that. I don't think they'll be able to stop it. <laughs> okay, so, hopefully. Just m my two cents. I, I think you don't need to talk about independence and secession right now to people. You can talk about self-government right now and get more, more people on board with that. And then if the federal government does block that, then you can say, okay, well, we've, we tried, right? We tried all legal avenues. We tried all the, all the normal steps to work within the system. And now we've got to do this. Next uh, thing. I see it more as it's easier to say, I want to file for a divorce than it is to say, hey, how about we try an open marriage? <laughs> Yeah, it depends on the marriage, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's an abusive one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, well, well, there, yeah. If you're being abused, maybe you, you, uh, you, know, you, you negotiate with your, your hostage taker. Uh, <laughs> but my, my point is, regardless of whether you support secession or you support self-government or something in between, what you need is some kind of New Hampshire identity. Um, even before you start pitching the benefits of this, there just needs to be a kind of consciousness that we have this shared history of this shared identity. We need to think of ourselves as being distinct in some way from the rest of the country. Um, I think that definitely Scots, the Scots have uh, a, a powerful sense of nationalism, uh, just like Puerto Rico and, uh, and uh, Jefferson, the, the soon to be uh, Jefferson uh, US. Uh, you've got a bunch of uh, uh, cattle farmers and uh, you know, sparsely populated uh, who all have an identity, uh, uh, they have a collective, and they're all individuals, um, but they're doing the same thing. Uh, so I think that it's, uh, you know, getting everyone on the same sheet of paper, I think is very, very important. And that's, the, just like you just mentioned, it's a big, big problem here in, in the States. Uh, there's, you know, everyone's so divided. There's so many different variants, and they're all living in the same communities, and they can't agree on anything. And I think it's really important to get everyone on the same sheet of music uh, at the end of the day in order to make something like this happen. Um, otherwise, oh, and, and of course, you know, our nation, huge as it is, people still have, and a lot of them are, you know, the generations before me, because I don't, I don't feel it at all, but they have this s strong sense, sense of nationalism. And, you know, how could you even think of, you know, wanting to, to uproot and pull your little section of the U.S. out because, you know, you're, you're part of the family, man. You can't just leave. Um, you can't just, yeah, unless maybe, you know, California might be leaving pretty soon. Well, with uh, There's only one with family a, I know that never lets you leave. <laughs> the mob. <laughs> <laughs> or, or certain cults. The motherland. Um, so with that, how would, um, if uh, national identity or like a, a regional identity is needed. Uh, what are some ways that we can promote that? Well, I think I think first off, we've we've already started uh, that ball, and that is the Free State Project. And you know, um, we we individual thinking folk um, are you know spread throughout <laughs> spread throughout the lands in in small uh, numbers. Uh, if we could you know uproot. Uh, come to, it's not that cold, New Hampshire, and, uh, and you know, do exactly what we're doing now here in Keene, doing in Massachusetts, in uh, uh, Massachusetts, Manchester, do, uh, in Nashua. <laughs> uh, and, and by the way, Massachusetts, that's a big problem right there because you have, um, as far as creating our own individual outlook, getting, all of, getting us on the same sheet of music, we're kind of, you know, these guys from the South are, uh, they're moving up here pretty, pretty quick. And um, they don't know why, some of them don't know why they're moving. 
they I know why it's, it's because they're you know, they're oppressed and they're trying to get away from taxation and regulation and the whole nine. They come up here and they bring all their baggage with them and they try to start the same uh, you know the same system all over again. Um, so I think that this project that we're working on, we've got to get it off up and running because uh, as soon as we can get as soon as we can uh, increase the mindset that you know we are we're you know trying or we're experimenting with the faster that uh, will prevent people who want more regulation who want to, to everything to be paid for they want that safety net as soon as we can get them uh, outnumbered um, we they might decide that you know Connecticut is a better uh, on option or it maybe even Vermont but I mean don't don't mess with those New Hampshire folk they uh, they just want us all living in trailers yeah with no with no education I have to agree with you. I think you're making a really important point. And I think that it's really, it's more than just New Hampshire um, becoming a place where it has a culture. It's people. People don't look at themselves as individuals. Um, that's a unique quality to people in the libertarian movement. Um, when people refer to themselves, that it's, you know, it's that USA chant. Everybody... <clears throat> views themselves as part of this collective instead of looking at themselves as individuals. And I think once people, once we have that philosophical renaissance, that renaissance of the mind, that um, the, once people can think about themselves in a, a individualist way, which is why I started Objectivist Girl in the first place, is to try and push people to think as individuals, as independent, and show them that they're fully capable of running their own lives and having their own identity. And that's really the key to all of this secession talk is people need to feel like they're not going to screw it up if we give them their independence. If they have their independence, they're not going to mess it up. And so, um, and technology helps, but ultimately it's that renaissance of the mind. It's the idea that we build cultures through knowing who each individual person is. And you need to know who you are and what you want before you can build a culture. And I think that Americans in particular have a certain idea, a certain identity problem of thinking of themselves as Americans first and individuals second. And maybe that's just because I lived here my whole life, but I see that all around me. And I see this, I, I went to uh, International Students for Liberty Conference last year, and the, the, all of the countries that were there were announced. And when um, America was announced, everybody started chanting USA. <laughs> Like, like, uh. like, like a bunch of meatheads. It was awful. And it was just, it was the most, I, I sunk down in my seat. I was so embarrassed. And it was so incredibly embarrassing for me. And you know, just the fact that I felt any need to slump down in my seat really shows you that even the most individual people, and this is a bunch of libertarians that are doing this. That's what's the most upsetting part about the whole thing. But ultimately, the fact that I was slumping down in my seat means that, I haven't even reached the individual level because I was embarrassed because people in my country were acting like buffoons. And so <clears throat> even I need to work on it. And this is something that you have to work on every day is reminding yourself that you're an individual. And I, I mean, I know Ian gets on me at, on Free Talk Live about the word we uh, in regards to uh, the US. So yeah, I'm really bad with the word we. But anyway, so... The point is, is that we need to work towards a philosophical renaissance, a renaissance of the mind. We need to stop this USA chanting banter, and we need to actually find out who we are at our core, and that's what's going to build a culture in New Hampshire. I just did it again. <laughs> uh, uh, we individuals. <laughs> I keep thinking Think of life, carefully Brian. about everything you say to avoid saying we to sound like a collectivist. It's 9 a.m. <laughs> that is very true. So, yeah. All right. Okay, so I mean, with with the whole thing with secession, we've kind of already talked about uh, a couple of things where um, other activism is almost like it's like building building the foundation for it. And there's multiple different forms of activism that can be done to promote secession, which isn't really 
pro secession at all, but you're building, you, you have to have a foundation to go on. Like we talked about the Free State Project coming in here, changing uh, the hearts and minds of the people that already live here into a liberty mindset. Um, we've talked about, uh, in, in that aspect, uh, building that identity. So just the fact that we're promoting signers to move here, it's like having an ulterior motive because we want people here, but I want them to support secession, but I need you know, more people to come here to do that. Uh, and then changing that uh, mentality with uh, an identity. Um, for me, uh, another uh, form of activism uh, is uh, Bitcoin. Because with Bitcoin, it's, a, another, it's another step in that foundation because the, a lot of times people always like, well, who's gonna make the money, you know? But th using something like Bitcoin, can completely uh, take that argument off the table and we're, uh, we're already building a uh, monetary system that doesn't need to be replaced if New Hampshire did secede. So uh, I don't know if you guys agree or not, but what was your opinion on Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies um, uh, in, in involved with uh, you know, like an ulterior motive of building that foundation for independence or any other activism you think should take place before that? So I really like the idea of Bitcoin and other cryptos. Uh, if you go back to my booth, you can see I've got the little QR codes where you can send me Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin. Although I hate myself for accepting that last one because I think it's the dumbest thing ever. But people want to give it to me every now and then, so I'll take it. But one thing with any sort of alternative, and you know, this includes gold, silver, wampum, whatever it is, th those are the shiny beads and seashells. Yeah, so you know, whatever it is that is not the US dollar, I don't want it to ever become legal tender. And the reason why is because legal tender has behind it a gun that says you must accept this and i don't want to must accept anything you know i if i decide that you know i want to give Kristen a book and she's going to give me two dozen eggs then you know we should do that eggs should not become legal tender chickens should not become legal tender me raking your leaves should not become legal tender there should not be any such thing as legal tender and the tyrant lincoln was the guy that first invented legal tender and the reason he did so was so that people would accept the treasury notes that he began printing to finance his war against people that were trying to become independent. Great points. Um, I agree with everything he just said. But um, I think there's another point to be made about Bitcoin. Um, I, I love Bitcoin. I really do. It's an amazing currency. Um, but I, the one thing that I see is a lot of people are rabbit holing into the idea that Bitcoin is the currency of the future. I think Bitcoin is a stepping stone. I think that it's temporary. I think it's showing people that you know there are other options, there are other ideas um, out there, and as technology grows, currency is going to grow. We couldn't have expected the internet. That's I mean nobody predicted that, um, and nobody predicted Bitcoin. So I mean if you've got it in your heads that Bitcoin is the ultimate, think about before the internet um, what you would have thought would be the future and uh, try and think if you thought it would be the internet um so anyway the point is is that uh, that scotland had a real issue with secession because of economic reasons they had a lot of economic reasons for voting no um that was the biggest concern was that you know they they didn't know how to deal with the idea that they'd be separated um and would have to run their own economy and um, with the inflation rate as high as it is, um, they were concerned. And so Bitcoin and other currencies like this would prove, would, would give them stability and would give them an alternative to be able to handle their own currency. And it just, it just proves that you can create a currency. It doesn't need to be backed by any force. Uh, it just needs to be backed by love. And because uh, that's the that's the free market. It's just a market of love, 
you love something, so you exchange something else that you love a little bit less. Does that mean you're going to create love coin? I, <laughs> yes, I believe so. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, is that um, Bitcoin is great. It, it, it's going to be something that helps in secession movements. It's going to be something that really projects us into the future of independence and independent thinking and the possibility of technology and the possibility of uh, independent minds doing really cool things. But ultimately, we need to see it as a stepping stone instead of the whole big picture future. So yeah, that's my two cents. So the currency issue did come up in Scotland, and it's a, it was actually a, a distraction. I don't think it is that relevant to secession. Um, so what happened in Scotland was uh, the Scottish National Party said, we want to share the pound after independence. And there were clear reasons they wanted to do this, to mitigate the sort of risk and uncertainty associated with changing currencies. Um, the... British government responded by saying that we don't have to let you share the pound. Now, what they meant by that was we don't have to give an independent Scotland representation on the Bank of England to set monetary policy. That's what they meant. Scotland could, could use the pound without having a central bank, without having representation on the Bank of England. But they do have a central bank. It's called the Royal Bank of Scotland. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a private bank that's owned by the government now since the financial crisis, or may, might have been privatized recently, but yeah. Um, the, the, so, but RBS was a big problem, though, because the response of the Better Together side to, um, uh, to the Yes campaign on this was, yeah, you can use the pound, just like uh, Panama uses the dollar, Ecuador uses the dollar. They don't, they don't have their own uh, central banks. But... Um, if you do so, you have these huge banks like RBS with lots of assets. You have no lender of last resort. So what happens? Are you going to be, be Iceland? Because they had these banks with these huge balance sheets vastly greater than Iceland's GDP. And there was no way that Iceland could rescue those banks. And so, you know, Scotland, you're going to have a financial crisis down the road and you're just going to go down the tubes because you can't do this. I think the answer to that is... Yeah, we're not going to have a lender of last resort. We're going to have an actually a, a competitive banking system. The currency issue is a, dist is a distraction. The, the banking issue, I think, is, is the real issue. Um, we can use whatever currency we want. We can repeal legal tender laws. I would support that. I actually think if you repeal legal tender laws, people would probably still use dollars for the most part. Uh, so I think if New Hampshire seceded, it would probably use the dollar for the most part. And some people would use Bitcoin. Some people would use gold or Canadian dollars or euros. But probably most people would use it, the U.S. dollar. The currency issue is not the important issue. The real issue is what's your financial system going to be like so that you can guarantee that you're going to have stability after, after independence and you can answer this objection that, oh, you're going to you know, be subject to these wild swings. I think that the economy is definitely uh, the reason why a lot of secessions get kicked off in the first place. When the safety net leaves and when you don't know where your next, uh, where, where your next job is going to be, uh, who you're going to be working for next or where you're going to get your next meal, uh, people start uh, having less and less faith in, you know, the people who, you know, were taking care of them. And I, I would like to walk away peacefully from the union um, right now. Uh, but I don't know that it, that will ever, you know, cross a lot of people's minds until uh, the collapse, until we get closer and closer to the collapse. And like you just mentioned, what what are the alternatives? You know, what what where is the stability uh, if if that was to happen? And cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin provide that. And a lot of people don't know about it. But I mean, as we get closer to that, more and more people are going to wake up to, hey, you know what? I can pay my employees with Bitcoin. And hey, it's not taxed yet, so I'm you know I got that benefit, and uh, and it, and it's much easier to use because technology is cool like that, and it's you know making making purchases on Amazon with Bitcoin, uh, which they don't accept Bitcoin yet, do they? Not yet. Indirectly, if you purchase a card gift through cards. Gift Gyft. But I mean, but this whole you know trying to um, count out change uh, out of my pocket to pay for a hamburger is you know this is this is so old school. This is dark ages. I want to just flash my phone at you and uh, you take my hamburger. Um, so yeah, Bitcoin, love it. The technology and and of course the the internet. Um, you know, instead of finding out about Scotland uh, seven days later, I mean we're watching it happen. 
and you know, g- g- guys are on Free Talk Live commenting on you know the actual uh, you know uh, the stream that's taking place. Um, so yeah, the Dark Ages are uh, I think what kept a lot of uh, a lot of this um, from not happening in a timely manner. And I think as long as we as long as we can filter through all the the cat memes and the uh, uh, the uh, the silly videos on uh, on our on our our you know our streams, uh, we can get the actual news as it takes place and be more aware of what's really going on. I think that's the most important thing. People are can be can if they choose to be up to date uh, and find out the you know the powers that be and keep them in check. Copblock.org, you know, perfect example. You know. This this whole you know love your uh, your hero law enforcement officer is a is a thing of the past. People are you know waking up to the idea that uh, they don't work for us, and neither does government, and neither do a lot of these guys. They're all in it for themselves, and uh, so yeah, um, I, I think it's a good time to be alive. I agree, and I think there's one more important point to be made about Bitcoin, and it's that paper money is disgusting. <laughs> Hashtag, that's how you get Ebola. Ebola. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, for me, Bitcoin is, or any other cryptocurrency, you're you're building, uh, just having that in there is showing that uh, people can use other currencies because people start using Bitcoin. Even if it's not like, I don't want it to be like a a de facto currency. It's just the, it's another uh, plank where you're, you're throwing out that idea that we don't have to use a dollar. We can just use something completely different that's all digital. Uh, it's a whole new way of thinking. But it's again, you're you're getting people to think outside of like the Federal Reserve System or whatnot. They're they're thinking, you know, started to think in Bitcoin, so starting to thinking in dollars. Um, so well, we do have a uh, question. So, Ed, um, <coughs> kind of heading down Bitcoin, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if any of you have heard of, uh, I guess, block, Get closer to the mic, please. block, if you, blockchain 2.0 technologies seem to want to start creating forms of government that are voluntary, where you have laws that are. I think you're talking about BitNation. Yes. And uh, they have a lot of problems. Uh, one of which is their entire development team resigned less than 48 hours before they were supposed to begin their crowdfunding. Uh, but the guy went ahead with the crowdfunding about 24 hours late. Um, just just a little elaboration on this. As you secede and you tr- attempt to set up some form of cooperative rules, not everybody within the liberty movement is an anarchist, obviously. There's minarchists, there's people who have certain ideologies. Do you think there will, do you foresee any way to deal with the infighting, perhaps in a blockchain 2.0 technology or some other form? Um, I think that that could possibly happen. Um, with BitNation, it's not going to. Um, the, tr- the trust is not there. Uh, with them. Uh, If you want to learn more about that, actually I did a really good uh, interview with Matt McKibben, who is on the BitNation team, uh, through two objectives. So you can download that. Anyway, the the point is is that um, I think that is possible to have Bit governance, um, but I think that and and you know uh, dealing with each other through uh, through Bitcoin and through through any free market stuff, but it's definitely not going to come through BitNation. I don't believe that there's we're ever going to get away from the infighting, that the headbutting. It's it's just it's just human nature, and uh, the only way to, the only real solution is to just to make sure that everyone is held accountable and that the, the words that are coming out of their mouths are recorded and someone can hold you know hold them accountable at the end of the day. Um, and if as long as it's voluntary and you can opt out because you don't like who you're dealing with, you don't like you know like the policies that are uh, being you know heaped on your shoulders, and you, you can opt out at the end of the day. That's you know that's uh, I think I'm I think I'm in and out. Um, yeah. So no 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 solution to the infighting until uh, you know until we've evolved out of this silliness, um, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon. I think the way you get away from the infighting is having the in part of it to where, you know, there, there is such a thing as a polycentric civilization. It 
existed in the past and I'm sure that it could exist in the future. Uh, one great example of polycentric civilization would be Ireland for the 2000 years that it was you know, semi-stateless. There, there were certainly governments, but there was no the state, if you will. And there were the different tribes within or clans, whatever you want to call them. And they all had their own form of governance, but they lived among one another so that maybe me and Lauren are next door neighbors, but we're not part of the same government or governance society. But Jason and I are, and he lives a mile and a half away from me. So you can have, you know, stuff without it being geographically similar and then you figure out the sort of ways and medina in what is now the uh, saudi arabia area they had a history in the early uh you know like two three hundreds where there were christians pagans jews and muslims that were all living in the city together and they figured it out of if a Christian and a Jew have a problem, then this is how they settle it, et cetera. So polycentric can definitely work. Uh. You know, I, I actually would prefer to change my answer. The reason that oh we God. have no, you, you, <laughs> infighting is because, and especially in the, li the libertarian arena, is because we're libertarians. I mean, we've put ourselves in this collective again. We're always going to debate. We just, we collectivized ourselves again. I, th that's why I don't subscribe to the whole libertarian thing. Um, but yeah, no, the solution to the infighting is to not have an in. There is no in. There's just, you are an individual and stop thinking of yourself as a collective. That's, that's the problem that we're having. All right. Uh, next question. I guess this is primarily aimed at uh, Jason. So with the Scottish uh, recent situation, first there was an upper no vote for secession, and then eventually the government you know, introduced autonomy, and they didn't end up seceding. Uh, and now you have even, um, there's an English autonomy movement where England is saying, wait, the UK is oppressing us, England wants more autonomy. So isn't this kind of what your original white paper for the Free State Project was about, whereas New Hampshire maybe would threaten secession, or it would be a secession movement, but then it would result in greater autonomy uh, for the whole, you know, the whole US? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I, I think uh, you need to have access to to the tool of secession in order to get more autonomy. And if we see, um, if we compare the U.S. and Canada, I think uh, it's an instructive comparison because the U.S. has a more decentralized constitution than Canada. So the, the U.S. Tenth Amendment gives all the residual powers to the states. The Canadian and the people. What's that? And, and the and, people. And the people. Yes. Uh, in theory. Right. The Canadian Constitution gives the residual powers to the federal government. So it's a more centralist constitution, but Canada's more decentralized than the U.S. Uh, not a lot of Americans realize that, but provinces have a lot more powers than American states. For instance, there's no equivalent to the SEC in Canada. Each province has its own financial regulator. Uh, Quebec can control its own immigration and citizenship policies. Not all of it. Well, so, yeah, that's right. They, they have some, certain... Yeah. Um, and I think Quebec controls its own social security system as well. Is that right? Yeah, so they can, in fact, they get an opt out of federal taxes for this portion that they control. So, I mean, that's kind of the stuff that we want, right? Those are the sorts of things that we would like. Yes, let us opt out of social security, let us opt out of federal income tax. We'll handle these things ourselves. So, why is Canada much more decentralized than the U.S.? Because of Quebec, I think. Uh, if, if you didn't have. Well, Quebec is the one pushing these powers, but a lot of other provinces have, have you know, they, they don't necessarily want to control citizenship and immigration to the same extent, but they've, they want to control their own economic policies, their own health policies. You know, Alberta has been considering doing its own thing with, with the health system. Uh, so, you know, the, once you have one province, one state going its own way and making a credible exit threat, the government has to make concessions to them. And then other places want those concessions too. Uh, and that's how you get a more decentralized polity in my view. So uh, there, there are benefits to the whole country from what we're doing here. Positive externalities, if you will. All right, uh, go ahead. Yep. So I recently started a website uh, back in, I believe it was June, um, 
ANCAP FAQ, A N C A P F A Q dot com, basically explaining the nuts and bolts of how you know, a free market anarchist society would work. Um, because I think there's a lot of people who are minarchists who are only minarchists because they don't understand uh, all the minutia of how that could play out. They don't understand, like, you know, external defense, internal defense, and so forth. So I put that together as a go to place to handle all these issues, you know, combining things that I've read with some of my own thoughts, you know, looking at things as an engineer, how would, the, how would this all work, you know, take a look under the hood. So perhaps something similar for secession, uh, for instance, uh, you know, how would uh, travel work if your uh, passport is no longer valid, or what would happen to, you know, so-called federal property like uh, White Mountain National Forest and, you know, the North Country and so on. So uh, some sort of uh, go-to place uh, to answer some of these commonly asked questions. Uh, because right now the number, I think, uh, nationwide is like 28 percent people who are, you know, would, or would want to, their state to secede. So something to boost that number, perhaps perhaps that could be uh, over 50%, maybe even right now, if people could be convinced of the practicality of it. Um, well, I know uh, fo uh, the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence does have a lot of uh, bullet points that answer like what would happen if New Hampshire declared independence in regards to a lot of different uh, specific details. Yeah, and, and some of that of like, who would own the White Mountains? It sounds as though you're wanting me to answer, like, who would build the roads or who would, you know, send the eggs to the grocery store. Like, I don't have all of these answers, but somebody would wind up buying it. Somebody would wind up taking care of it. I don't know who. Just like the... Uh, po like, I don't know who yeah. builds the computers. Yeah. I just know that I can buy them. Yeah, basically, obviously, some sort of privatization, but, like, maybe details of how that would go, like... Would the money go to uh, a bondhold, like people who own government debt uh, or taxpayers or some, some combination of it? So like all federal property and perhaps even in going to Ancapistan, would you know state and municipal property all be the privatization process? How would that money get divvied up to people? Well, that, that's something yeah, that, that would that have sort to, of thing. That, that's something that would have to be you know, worked out and determined by the people that are writing the new constitution for the Republic of Free Hampshire. Uh, you know, and again, I don't have the answer and I don't think anybody up here has the answer unless all of us are representatives to the government of Free Hampshire after we wind up seceding. Daryl, how do magnets work? <laughs> You've got a north end and a south end and ask that question to juggalos and they will get confused. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I think a, um, a, a fruitful way to go is maybe not necessarily to have some sort of comprehensive plan down to the, down to the letter about exactly what we're going to do, um, but instead to approach it piecemeal and deal with particular policies that we would like decentralized in New Hampshire. Again, I'm, my incrementalist side is showing, but I think this is how you appeal to people is is show, well, this is, this is a, uh, a policy that really makes sense. The federal government isn't allowing us to do it. We've got all these experts who say that this is the policy to do. Let's ask the, the, you know, let's ask the federal government first for permission to do, do it ourselves. And if they, don't, if they say no, then we'll find a way to, to make it happen you know, unilaterally. Uh, so something like uh, replacing the welfare state with a, a minimum basic income, something like that, which you know, it's an incremental reform. It's not total freedom. But it's um, you know getting rid of all these housing and health agencies that that control people's lives and and uh, and and soak up a lot of this money. You fire all those bureaucrats and you give people a check. You know maybe well, once a month we'll, check. I'll say fire. They'll they'll be. Uh, Don't say fire. Yes, that that'll, 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 that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are these are, are also not allowed attrition. to say fire in a crowded these DC, convention hall. These yes. are DC Oops. bureaucrats, though. You know, I, I, you see fired. They're yeah. not they're not voters fired. here. Fired. <laughs> but but so you know, the federal government says we don't want to let you do this, uh, even though economists say hey this would this would benefit your economy. It would, it would encourage people to work. You get rid of all these work disincentives. You you reduce your tax burden, and so maybe we we do it, or we or we have someone slip an amendment into a bill in Congress and say you know pilot project New Hampshire gets to do you know replace its welfare state with this. Yeah, I'm going to join you in the incrementalist. Uh, 
thought process. I, it's wonderful that there are so many people in support of independence. I believe it's a whopping 17% right now of America that supports the idea of 23. secession. 23.9. Is it 23? Are you kidding me? Okay. It's 17% in New Hampshire. Okay. So anyway, 17% in New Hampshire, that's really the concern. We just are dealing with New Hampshire. So the, the point is, is that there's 17% of people, but that's, you know, if you took a vote, 17% can't win you independence. So Yeah, but um, how many people actually vote? So if we can just get those 17%. Yeah, you just, I, I know, you just need the I people know, that I know, are actually going to change not, pe things here. If people get heated about it, and people, you know, there's a lot of people on welfare that don't want to leave welfare um, and don't want to leave the easy life. And so those people go out and vote, so we can count on them. And then there's a bunch of people that are getting, that work for the government, so we can count on them. And th there's, you know, there's other things and other factors. There's people with family in other places that are going to think, you know, I'll be separated from my family, which is kind of ridiculous, but that's okay. I mean, people are silly and they think things that aren't rational. So we need to keep that in mind. So instead, I agree with you entirely. We need to be slowly rolling back government and looking at each individual issue and saying, okay, so this is why this is not working and that's why this plan, this smaller plan will work better. Um, and so you need to slowly ease people into that idea because you have to remember that most people operate on the on their emotions and one of the strongest emotions when you bring up independence is fear people are afraid people are terrified you know why because they don't trust themselves they, they say they the don't news. trust other people but it, it's really that they don't trust themselves they just blame it on other people when they say i'm afraid somebody will come over to my house and shoot me it's really that they're afraid that they're going to go over and and hurt other other people during a freedom movement. And so, think, yeah, fear. As far as introducing these ideas to noobs, I think that yes, that's the way to do it. Yeah. You know, you know, small increments. Small increments. I don't think it'll ever work. I think that uh, at the end of the day, it really is. It really is going to take a you know the collapse that is going to really really hurt. This because uh, throughout history, it's always you know someone needs a reason the, why the, they the want the empire it. runs out of money. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and. And hopefully, you know, technology is and Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, alternatives are at our disposal when that does happen. And we're surrounded by like minded peoples. You know, let Mississippi go through their uh, event. We here in New Hampshire, you know, we'll have our own communities and we'll have and backup plans. And, you know, and we're foreseeing all of this uh, before it actually comes. That's the best thing to have at our disposal is the foresight. A, 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 yeah, an escape option. Um, otherwise, yeah, it's going to hurt. Um, I, and I foresee that, actually. Yeah. All right. We have some more questions, so go ahead. Okay. So if New Hampshire were to peacefully secede, what kind of impact do you think that it would have on companies that do a lot of work, or even the majority of the work, outside of New Hampshire? Um, how much harder would it be for New Hampshire companies to get business with all these ridiculous international policies and laws? Well, uh, let's, let's use Burger King as an example. Uh, there are a bunch of Burger Kings across the U.S., and I'm sure there's probably some in Canada, our friendly neighbor to the north. Uh, and Burger King recently moved their headquarters north of the borderline, and it has not stopped them from providing hamburgers that are somewhat tasty and flame broiled, and I hate that Keen no longer has one, uh, but you know, with all of the large international businesses that already exist, I don't really see that really becoming a problem, and then, you know, Hopefully, the Republic of Free Hampshire does not sign on to NAFTA and CAFTA and GATT because those aren't really about free trade. It's about, you know, like control under the guise of free trade. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, large businesses anyway, and New Hampshire has that, you know, New Hampshire advantage with a very low corporate tax rate. So it might actually incentivize businesses to move into the tax haven that would be the Republic of Free Hampshire and wind up being beneficial to the corporations. Although in like the free society that I want, corporations aren't going to exist in the current form, but you know, that's something to tackle down the road. So um, I actually disagree with you. Um, I think that it's gonna be very difficult for a while. I don't wanna sugarcoat it. Um, 
We'll have just, if we seceded, we would have just really ticked off the US federal government, uh, who has, has, has so many ally, allies, uh, people that are afraid of them is really what that means, um, <laughs> that, that they're, gonna fe- they're not gonna want, there's gonna be a huge trade embargo. It's gonna, it's gonna be a problem for a while. But the good news is that New Hampshire is a place where there aren't, we don't rely on a lot of big corporations here to take care of our needs. It's mostly small businesses. When I moved here, it was a complete shock to me. Um, there, I couldn't. There were so many restaurants that I used to go to that aren't here, that were everywhere else, and that that's why New Hampshire is the perfect place to secede. Is because if that happens, we actually have all the terrains necessary to be able to produce our own food. We also have a lot of small businesses. It's going to be. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be rough for a while until the U.S federal government is not pissed off at us anymore because they're, they're going to be mad. And that's, I mean, it's the government. They're spiteful and hateful and angry, and that's what they do. So, no, it, it's not going to be okay. I don't want to sugarcoat it. If, but let me just clarify real quick that when I, what I was talking about wasn't like the day after secession. What I was talking about was the day after international recognition that might take five to ten years. Hmm. Oh. Go ahead. As far as uh, New Hampshire seceding, I, you know, that's what I'm after, but uh, maybe Texas should do it first. Let them be the guinea pig. Let the, let the feds focus all their power and energy on those silly guys down there, and we'll just kind of slip off in the night and become, huh. become an offshoot of Canada. 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 <laughs> spell, Canada. Spell what a K. And we can't, we can't say that anymore, Daryl, because we actually have a... Can- There's two Canadians here that I know of. Go ahead, Jason. Well, this is uh, the reason, one reason why I don't think um, secession is the first best option, uh, because uh, presumably New Hampshire would, would be totally free trading unilaterally, and there'd be some benefits to that, but the U.S. government could impose trade restrictions on us. And I think those would actually be pretty hurtful to the, to the New Hampshire economy, because it's a, uh, it's a sm- small state. Uh, both in terms of population and territory. So we're really dependent on markets outside of our own borders. And, uh, and so there would be a big, uh, big welfare loss from, that, um, uh, from, from those border restrictions. If we did become independent, I think we'd have to join NAFTA and the WTO and things like that because that's where smaller countries can get their voices heard to some degree. Um, you know, if you look at uh, secessionists everywhere uh, in the in the West, they're all very much in favor of these multilateral institutions, right? Scotland, the Scottish Nationalists, very pro EU. Same with the Catalan secessionists. Quebec, the most pro NAFTA part of Canada, um, because this is this is how you get access to a broader market. And I think that's politically it makes sense, even if 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 you don't uh, think those institutions are ideal. You know, if you want access to a broader market and have a, have a say at the negotiating table, you've got to join those institutions. Mm-hmm. Another question? Or? So in it, it would be rough initially is yes. kind of this. Oh, yes. oh yeah. 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 It's not going to be easy uh, day one. Okay. But then again, just keep remembering that it's not easy living under a federal government that's killing people for doing nothing but being peaceful and living their own lives. So keep that in mind, that's important. Um, You have to look at the broad scheme of things and ultimately the hardships we would suffer under the federal government's wrath would not be even close to what we're dealing with right now. It's never easy leaving an abusive spouse. (laughs) Go ahead, Chris. Hi guys, um, please avoid references to Burger King because I'm trying to lose weight and I don't want to go drive out of the county to go fucking find one. Um, you, you would have to go to Vermont. <laughs> Vermont, all right. Well, Vermont's a nice place and I don't yeah. need a carry permit. So, um, <laughs> but every member of the panel today has said something about secession being a peaceful option and I can understand the temptation to call it that. It's easy to feel that way when the gun in the room doesn't actually have to go off. When we don't have to see the blood or smell the death, we may well be left with the impression that there is peace. 
Uh, but then the Cheshire County House of Corrections has far less physical combat than the gang-infested jails that I was incarcerated in in New York, but I'd hardly call it a peaceful place. Likewise, a referendum or a legislative act which separates one political union from another, while it may result in less actual bloodshed than insurrection, is still not peaceful. It is just democracy in action, as we know uh, democracy is anything but peaceful. What we're actually talking about is the more local thugs telling the out-of-towners that if they use violence against, they will use violence against them if they enforce foreign edicts on their turf. Additionally, as Daryl pointed out, Scotland may well have ended up with less freedom, a.k.a. more government coercion, had secession been successful. The same could be said if states like New York or California or Illinois decide to secede from the United States. Uh, I can personally agree that New Hampshire would be better off without the federal government. Uh, if New Hampshire did secede from the United States and the United States invaded, I would join the New Hampshire military and fight the United States, even though I'm an anarchist and I oppose the state government as well. So I support the effort and I can understand the motive for the propaganda. I just wonder if it's a wise strategy to mislead ourselves and others into believing that all this coercion is in fact peaceful. It actually could be and that's the thing is that a lot of people are confused by the fact that i know that there's a lot of violence coming out of the federal government but look at the history of secession i mean 14 countries were able to peacefully there was no violence peacefully secede but, from but do you, the Soviet do you understand Union. the difference it's the Soviet Union the empire was there, dead there, the I'm, empire I'm was sorry. dead i know that the us federal government is horrible but the soviet union government was much worse but do you do you recognize the difference between peace and coercion because i understand that there's a separation between physical violence and coercion right i understand a lot of people draw that line i don't see that line as very distinctive frankly so th when you're talking about peace what you're actually talking about is coercion preventing the actual combat Right. And there's and I think that's a really important line to draw that a lot of people really fail to do. And that's what I'm trying to hammer home here today. I, I would agree with that. Um, secession always violates some people's rights unless you're, you know, got unanimous consent to it uh, somehow. Um, so th so again, that's a reason for libertarians to when we think about secession, our attitude should be conditional. Well, how many people's rights are being violated compared to those whose rights are being better protected now? Right? How much freedom are we going to have after independence? Um, so, uh, so yeah, having a, having a right to secede, I think, on balance protects more people's rights than it infringes, but it still infringes some people's rights. So it's not a matter of, like, first moral principles. It's a matter of, really, institutional design. How are we going to set up uh, politics in this, in this country to, to work for the, the best? I, and I think there's a way that we can make not everybody happy, but... Most people happy. I think that there will be people if we actually voted to secede and won that vote, there would be a way. That, uh, obviously, we're not going to keep people here against their will. They are welcome to return to their mother country if they would like. Love it or leave it. Right? But, but at the same time, you know, they do have homes here and they have built a life here. But at this, I mean, there is a way that they can be compensated for their land. Um, New Hampshire could purchase it. I mean, th there's options. We have options. And there's a growing movement of libertarians. I don't think we'd have any problem refilling New Hampshire. For, for me, I don't really care if, uh, even if New Hampshire did to see, which I would love to see, anyone that's still living here as an American citizen that wants to be American citizen, still wants to give their income tax to the state, to, to the federal government, let them do that. Just don't, don't include me, that's all I want. As I've said several times, uh, I support a polycentric society, meaning that everybody should have the level of government that they want. So if somebody wants you know, Maggie Hassan to be the governor, then Maggie Hassan should be their governor. I'm writing in none of the above, so I shouldn't have a governor that tells me that you know, I can't go get medicine that I need for the headache that I've had for well over three years. I shouldn't be thrown in jail by the non-existent governor because I don't want there to be one. So you know, the way I'm describing it is polycentric, which removes the coercion and it allows everybody to have the level of government that they want. As, as far as we here in New Hampshire and, 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 my, and here in Keene uh, are concerned, uh, I'll go right back to it. It really uh, is dependent on the numbers. And if we, and that's the only way it's gonna work peacefully. And that, uh, you know, 
to get enough of us together in the same community to just stop paying the taxes. You know, I disagree with the, the government daycare that, that it, that's, you know, uh, upwards of 52% of my property taxes. I don't agree with it. I agree, I agree with this private school over here. I'm gonna stop paying you that 52%. And if, there's, if another 100 individuals in, on the same street as me to decide to do the same thing, the snowball effect will happen then. Um, this is this is this is targeting the peaceful uh, removal of ourselves from this system. Otherwise, like I said, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to. There's going to be a lot of no, uh, nastiness um, uh, to look forward to. But yeah, this is. I think. I think we're trying to do it peacefully. I yeah, know. I would want pe peacefully. Um, absolutely. I, and I think we can do it. It's just like I said. We need to uh, uh, gather numbers and get together, and uh, and that's not going to happen uh, in Florida. Um, but well, there's a chance and a hope here. Is that, For me, there it is. is a chance and a hope here. I wouldn't be here if there wasn't a chance or a hope. All right, well, time is coming up short, but uh, go ahead, Emmanuel. Okay, I actually have multiple points because I feel like, first, like I should have been on, on this panel, being from Quebec. Um, so. Um, yeah, but you haven't moved yet. Not yet because Hampshire of the immigration activists. laws, but anyway, um, multiple, okay, so um, first, um, my first question, my first point, um, would you support independence if it was the socialists pushing for independence? Like in Quebec for la the last 50 years, the Parti Québécois, which is the Scottish Nationalist Party. If government? Quebec wants to become independent, they should be allowed to. No. Uh, everybody should, as I've said numerous times, everybody should have the level of government that they want. So if the socialists want to form their own socialist government, they should be allowed to. But I don't want to live in a socialist country. So then you shouldn't be forced to be part of the social. Like, you can be free in their area if that's what you want, if Daryl's the emperor of the universe. Okay. There, there is a difference between freedom and secession. Uh, secession does not mean freedom. It, it, there still can be a New Hampshire government, and we'll have to deal with that. And so, yeah, there's a difference between secession and freedom. But I think if the socialists want to separate Quebec from the rest of the country, I think that's a great move. I think that it's a step towards acquiring freedom, yes. And, and, well, ma and maybe they'll do something right that actually works, that the rest of us can emulate it at the end of the day, because it makes, it makes so much sense. But if we're all the same cookie cutter mold, uh, the cook cookie cutter shape, then you know, we, where, where does the competition come from? Where does the innovation come from? It doesn't exist, because you know, it's just the same old. There's an even better solution than just letting uh, Quebec as a province secede on the basis of a 50% plus one referendum, I think, which is to the Canadian government to negotiate conditions for that, which would be uh, let the majority Anglophone communities, the Crees, the Mohawks, secede from Quebec. Um, you know, if you're going to allow secession, that doesn't necessarily mean it's just, you know, 50% plus one in whatever territory that referendum is held. I think you can try to set it up in such a way that you respect more freedom, you know, as much freedom as possible. So would you, would you do it county by county? Like in sure. Scotland had 32 regions, 30 voted no, but two voted yes. Would those two regions get their independence out of like the UK and be their own county? I, I think they should be allowed to, to, to choose that option. I, I would break it down even further to the individual level. I think the focus needs to be on making it smaller and smaller. So the first step would be to separate from the big government, then we separate from the state government, then we separate from the local government. You need to folk, you need to work together with everybody, even the socialists, if you want to secede. That's what you got to do. Sometimes you got to band together with people you don't particularly like if you all have the same idea. Well, like for but me, that's I, the thing. I don't want to secede from Canada. I want. I, I, I mean, and then I was supportive of the Scotland's uh, secession because they they used to be their own country they, before 1707. Quebec never was its own country, and I feel like I'm. I'm from, what? Uh, I said arguably Quebec was definitely its own nation and there's a difference between a nation and a country uh the the people of quebec and i i'm speaking in broad terms here uh let's just say the french uh you know the, the people that are descendant of the french that lived in what was originally new france that was its own nation before getting taken over by the British Canada. So it's arguable of whether or not it had its own distinct national identity. So New Hampshire was part of New, New France at one point. Should you like 
consider that. I mean, I, I, I think that there should be seven plus billion nations in the world. I yeah. attempted to secede in 1995 and form the free state of Daryl. And Lauren Rumpler is actually within my territory right now because it's a three foot radius around my person. So I think that there, there should be as many nations as there are people. All right, uh, we got we only had a couple minutes left, so yeah, one more question or? Uh, sure. Okay, so um, usually the Quebec uh, secession, independence, separation debate is axed on uh, whether they keep the, the Canadian dollar, where they keep the Canadian passport, whether they keep the uh, borders uh, with Canada, the free flow of, and the last. The, just last week, this, uh, there's the leadership um, uh, race to get the party uh, leader of the Quebecois um, party, and one of the candidates said Quebec should have its own peaceful army. So, and that kind of sparked the discussion on my Facebook. So I was. Just, what is a peaceful army? <laughs> sounds like an oxymoron. oxymoron that's what no, actually, a, I think a peaceful army would be a defensive army. So I, I, I was just wondering, considering that uh, New Hampshire has an international border with Quebec. Um, a little one though. Um, how would that uh, how would that international uh, issue be uh, treated? I, I think it's a uh, the, the, your peaceful uh, defensive army definitely is just one more tool. Uh, just like the just having the option of secession on the table is another tool uh, that uh, that peoples can can use could utilize uh, to uh, to increase their autonomy. Uh, I would be more than happy to join Cantwell's uh, army when it, when, when, it, when it gets to that. Um, I know that the Oath Keepers, uh, Chris Reitman is a member of their, you know, their, uh, Friedman? Reitman. Uh, previous uh, military, previous law enforcement officers who actually uh, believe in the, uh, the oath that they signed on to, you know, to protect or to, uh, to back up the Constitution and to uh, not take uh, uh, firearms from the people. Um, so I mean, they're 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 out there, and uh, I, I, we're we're waiting in the ranks, ready to do this. And so it might just take someone stepping forth and uh, uh, creating that peaceful defensive tool uh, to uh, to cause to cause the snowball change that we're looking looking for. All right, we're going to get one more question before we end this panel. Okay, this is kind of a comment. I was uh, interested in the identity discussion, where people identify with being part of the United States. So maybe we could attack that. Maybe the United States does a lot of things wrong, so um, there should be a concerted effort to embarrass people for being part of the United States. And we, let, let, let me just finish. There's a lot, and what you had said before, Lauren, was um, about having to make friends with, we take something like the Occupy movement, right? They did more to identify the one percenters and to tell people you're getting a really raw deal than anyone else. One group that I'm involved with is the 9-11 Truth Movement. You know, and I don't know how this room feels, I mean, but some people understand that that was a, you know, false flag operation. Other people don't believe it. But we have architects and engineers. Now, this would severely embarrass the U.S. government if, should, should this come to light. So, and the, the, I mean, the, all across the country, there are people dissatisfied in, in various ways. You know, and it has to do with foreign aggression, homeland oppression, debt, and incarcerations, existing car incarcerations, all these things. And, and there's so many groups around. A concerted effort to say this government is wrong and, and, and we need something else. Well, yeah, for me, I was well, let me go ahead. Uh, for me, in regards to identity, is not wanting to be an American. Like, in my daily life, uh, I always act as if, you know, any kind of patriotism comes up or anything like that, I don't associate with them. I'm me, I'm an individual. Uh, I wouldn't consider myself like a, you know, we joke around like the liberty community that we're porcupines and stuff like that because it's like our own little pride like community type, uh, type of stuff. And they, I'm just an individual human being. Whenever someone uh, like starts talking about being an American or a patriot, I say that's them. That's not me, especially when everyone uses uh, words like uh, Lauren over here to keep using oh, states words on. like we. You know, in your own personal I life, working uh, on you, it. Okay. You uh, you immediately stop them. And just say no. That's that's not me. That's not involving me. Don't don't include me when you're speaking about uh, the everyone on this continent. Hello, hi, uh, new new anarchist. Um, so 
Anyway, um, I, there is a lot of effort to embarrass the U.S. government or expose the U.S. government. I mean, look, just, just look at Facebook, especially with the people that you're friends with. Um, we're all friends with each other, and we spend most of our day trying to embarrass the U.S. government on Facebook. Um, also, I mean, how long has Alex Jones been doing his show trying to expose and embarrass the U.S. government? The embarrassment tactic doesn't work. I mean, yeah, I keep doing it. I disagree. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. I mean, <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's, it can be helpful in small increments, but ultimately, that's not what's going to change people. People need to be changed from inside. They need to actually believe that they are capable of running their own lives. And if you talk to people, they don't think that. They think that they need someone else between government obsession with getting married i mean not everybody gets married to be to, you know have their lives coexist with somebody else but a lot of people do um and it's not about two individuals combining you know working together it's about you know my other half and this is the disease that we have in this world is that people think that they're not whole that they can't run their own lives people are so afraid to just you know get in a car and it, he, because the government is not there to protect them at this moment. And, you know, that's the thing is that we need to empower people. We need to stop spending our effort on trying to bring down the state. Instead, we need to build people up to believe that they are more than just these little ants that the government controls and runs. Um, and people don't believe that. And that's scary. And I, that's, that's why we need a philosophical renaissance and why we need objectivism. I'm going to go there. Go, go. go ahead, Jason. Oh. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 1830s, a British visitor was uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, and he met uh, two young men, and he used the, the phrase at one point in his conversation, you Americans. And they quickly corrected him and said, we're not Americans, we're South Carolinians. And uh, if you look at um, polls now in Scotland and Catalonia, you get about 30% of the population saying we're Scottish, not British, we're Catalan, not Spanish. Um, how many n people would say I'm New Hampshireite, not American? A I trivial, would say I'm a trivial human. percentage of the population. So I'm, I'm just saying we are very, very far away from having that kind of identity that would support uh, a strong secession movement here. I'm not saying it can't happen, but it, we're far away from that. All right, uh, we are uh, up on. I, I just want to make one point real quick. Uh, earlier on, uh, Jason had mentioned that around the world, with the exception of the U.S., beginning in like the 1960s, there were all of these strong uh you know like minor parties and whatnot that grew up and the reason that that did not happen in the u.s is because of people like eugene debs in the 1920s uh henry wallace in 1948 and george wallace in 1968 every time in american history since the early 1900s that there has been a strong alternative candidate do somewhat successfully at the at the national level you've had all of these state governments restrict ballot access to eliminate choices and all of the other countries have for the most part maintained equal ballot access in the uk and in canada every party has the same path to the ballot and you wind up with you know consistently five parties in the canadian parliament five or six parties in the british parliament and it's because they're actually allowing people the choices on their ballots, whereas here they're forcing people to run as Republicans and Democrats and then writing letters to the editors of these damn libertarians are lying to you. They're running as Republicans and Democrats. Well, make it easier for us to run as what we actually are. All right. End of rant. So, uh, again, this... Uh I just want to thank uh, everyone on this panel because we are running out of time here. So uh, thank you for everyone being on this panel. Uh, for me, uh, 
I want secession in my lifetime. I want independence. I know that's like at least 10 years out. Uh, what I ask everyone to do is just try and at least talk to your neighbors, uh, talk up uh, more independence in regards to uh, other forms like getting more liberty mounting to people here, uh, to building up a culture, to uh, Bitcoin or any other activism you may do. Uh, we have a long road ahead of us and building up that culture is going to be a huge part of that. Hey guys, I'm going to use my executive privilege to uh, extend the, the panel just a little bit. Apologies to the direct action folks who are waiting patiently, but I just wanted to throw this one more question out. Um, so Jason, you had said earlier, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, don't talk about secession or don't talk about New Hampshire declaring independence at this point, as though to hold that conversation off to the future. I'd like you to answer why not. And then after you're done, I'd like for the rest of the panel to talk about your encounters with people who are New Hampshire people like Granite Staters, you know, because I know, Rob, you've been doing a lot of outreach in the Manchester area. We've certainly done our share uh, here in Keene with the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence and their excellent flyer, which we do have some over on the table for anyone who hasn't seen them yet. Uh, so Jason, that, that question to you and then to the rest of the panel, what has your experience been in talking to New Hampshire folks about this idea? I think we get 99% of what we want with the 10th Amendment applied seriously. Um, even foreign policy, so let's say we seceded, then we're no longer part of the U.S. foreign policy, but the U.S. is still going to be engaging its belligerent foreign policy around the world. That We're not going to change that by breaking New Hampshire away. So, you know, controlling economic policy, controlling criminal policy, drugs policy, you know, civil liberties, all those things within New Hampshire, we can do that. Uh, under the original U.S. Constitution without having to having to scare people, in my view, with talk of secession or independence. I think it just it seems pre premature to people. Why don't we talk about self-government, self-determination, concepts uh, that are, I think, have broader appeal and, and, and press that uh, frontier further and further until we reach a hard limit where we have to say, okay, now maybe we have to make a decision whether we want to go, go beyond that. So at the beginning of the panel, I had mentioned that I take credit for the Puerto Rico vote. And I never really did explain that, so I'll take the opportunity now to explain that. In 2008, I was a write-in candidate for U.S. Senate in Alabama. And one of the platform points that I ran on was for every state in the U.S. and every territory and every Indian tribe to have a two-step vote for secession. Question one, do you want to change your status with the US government? Question two would then be independence or you know, for states, do you want to become a territory? And I don't know why anybody would make that option, but you know, like give them that option. And for the territories, the options would be statehood or independence. And it was in 2009, which was after the 08 election. Obviously, I did not become a U.S. senator. However, Ron Paul introduced a bill that would have given Puerto Rico that two-step vote. And that didn't make it through the House, but the Puerto Rican legislature in 2011 did pass that resolution. They had their vote in 2012. And of course, because it wasn't funded by the U.S. federal government, Barack Obama said, we will not recognize the results of your referendum, but we do want to at some point have a federally funded referendum for you. And now we're two years after that, and that's still not happened. Uh, so I, I do kind of take some credit for that because I, I honestly believe that had I not run on that platform and had I not met Ron Paul's legislative director, that that bill never would have been introduced, that Puerto Rico never would have had that vote, and possibly Scotland never would have had their referendum because you never want to be the first to have the referendum. So, okay, let the Puerto Ricans have their vote and then let us have ours. Although, you know, it could just be one of those things of, you know, correlation does not equal causation, but I want to just take credit for that, even if I'm not actually responsible. But it seems as though I am. As far as uh, talking to New Hampshire natives, I'm kind of a hermit and a recluse, and I work a lot. So I rarely ever leave the LRN studio or the Nauta bus unless it's to go get food or like go to social Sundays or go to Conan's to record Black Sheep Rising or come here. So I don't really talk to a lot of people because recluse and work a lot. So you say we're not ripe 
for independence. I say we're rotting for the want of it. <laughs> okay, good. Everybody got that. All right, awesome. Um, so, um, yeah, it wasn't, I think we're forgetting like the most important secession movement in history, which was the U.S. secession. I mean, and, and nobody thought we were going to win. <laughs> I mean, we had, we didn't have the numbers for it. Um, and I know that right now there's only 17% in support of it in New Hampshire, but that's a lot. And when Rob and I go out and talk to people, there are more people that are receptive to it than aren't. And the people who aren't are normally a lot older. So... And bu there, bureaucrats. Yeah, they're, they're probably not going to be around much longer. So, I mean, this is really one of the... You're not, you're not old. You're not the kind of... No. That we're, talking about, we're talking about missing teeth dentures people <laughs> so <laughs> well lauren before before you go on if i might the, you mentioned 17 percent. now if i'm not mistaken that's the number from the recent poll that where we talked about on the show. nationwide it was like 24 uh -huh. percent and then new, new england broke down to new england broke down to 17 percent i don't believe they broke down the individual no, states okay. on that so i think it would be very interesting for a poll to be done of new hampshire people and see if it, if it is higher because as you all know new hampshire folks are not the same as the rest of New England. And so you I suspect... You could contract SACL CAI to do that poll for you. They, That's a possibility. Okay. Reuters sure. broke that down. In fact, Vermont is uh, more likely. They have more numbers as far okay. as succession. Did concerned. they really? Yeah. Uh, th th what was New Hampshire's percentage? 17%. Really? Massachusetts is like uh, nine or something. And yeah. Vermont's, oh, wow. Vermont's up in... Uh, about 20, I think. Okay. And Arcadia is an idea. I mean, that's... Arcadia. Yeah, I mean, Arcadia is an idea. I'm not on board with Arcadia. Mm. I think that it's uh, too big. I think that there's too much opportunity for a centralized government to either maintain existence or exist again. I would like to see New Hampshire by itself. Um, but... Yeah. You know, that's just me. But the, the point is, is that there are people supporting this. It doesn't matter what the number is, because uh, it's not 50%. From talking. Um, and so, yes, from talking to people, you and I have had amazing experiences with people, younger people, and it's, it's mainly the older people that we meet that have issues with it. But, you know, I mean, I think that in a few years, this is going to be a real thing and I think that right now we should be talking about it because we're preparing for this generation to get on board when the older generation is gone because for, I think they're holding us back on it. From my experiences uh, when we were talking to different people out there about New Hampshire independence or just in my day-to-day -day life uh, obviously yes younger people are definitely more receptive I've have definitely had easier conversations because they don't they're not they haven't had that decades of uh, domestication by uh, the, being an American uh, so it's easier to kind of break into that uh, also one thing that I've noticed from living in New Hampshire is people love living in New Hampshire they may not consider themselves a New Hampshire right or whatnot but a lot of people here love New Hampshire I see people I see locals with New Hampshire tattoos left and right um, and it's easier for that. They, they, it, that's kind of like building into the culture, but they love that more than they love being American sometimes. And it's easier to approach a lot of those people because you're like, look, wouldn't you rather have independence here and be able to you know, live free or die than uh, deal with uh, the federal government? As far as the New, the New Hampshireites that I speak with, um, the, my neighbors, the people that I work with, the people I bump into in the streets, and I do try to get out of the liberty bubble on occasion, because it can be, uh, you, you know, one-minded, and you can get sidetracked, just like the statists we're fighting can get sidetracked in their own little, their own little universe. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, the people I talk to are dissatisfied with the current system. They don't necessarily know, you know, what the solution is or what to do about it or stick my head back in the sand. They're they're unsure, so they might not necessarily say, "Yeah, I'm all about self-governance and secession and the whole nine, but. Uh, they are at least, the, I would say, uh, more than 50% are at least so dissatisfied with the current system that they're open to suggestions. And uh, like I said, if 
if it wasn't for this this nasty safety net that everyone is uh, dependent on, it would be so easy just to walk away. But that's the big one right there. So I mean, it's uh, what do we have to outlive these old guys? Do we have to? Uh, do we do we need a good collapse so that we can go back to zero? Do we need the? Uh, do we need an alternative currency where I can you know keep my money with my place of employment and you know I decide how much of that money is given over to the community to pay for the sidewalk in front of my house or you know whatnot? It's it's the it's there it's here. Um, but the big question is you know is is talking about it? Is talking about it really going to work? at the end of the day is do we just need to sit back and uh, just wait for it to happen is that the other solution there's i, I don't you, you've got to talk it into reality and i think that's why talking about it is so important and i've been on the streets at pumpkin fest at music fest at uh, you know various different locations handing out these flyers out in front of independence day we did the independence day outreach uh, this year in both manchester and Keene, um and i've handed out hundreds if not thousands of these flyers at this point and you know most people will take will take one and they'll, they're walking somewhere, so I'm not going to stop them and, and talk to them. But some people will say, well, what's this about? And uh, my response is usually something very brief, like, oh, about New Hampshire declaring independence. Uh, and then you know, maybe they'll say one or two other things, but usually the response from the individual, and I'm always pre-qualifying people by asking, do you live in New Hampshire? I won't give it to anyone else. So the, the look on their face, as soon as they hear me say it's about New Hampshire declaring independence, they their face brightens up and it doesn't matter really what the age is. Their face brightens up and their eyes widen and they, put, they smile and there's usually some sort of really positive sounding response. Now maybe they don't know exactly what all the ins and the outs of that and what that would really entail and certainly we've discussed a lot of that today on this panel and I think that's why talking about it is so important so we can really solidify these ideas for the people who I agree with the other panelists. They are interested in this idea when it's presented to them. And just one more point, and Lauren keeps bringing up about the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union, but something that hasn't really been talked about as much, and I, I think not nearly enough, is that if you look at all of the new countries that have come into existence in the last 20 years that have gained international recognition, they all went through UN support. And as much as I hate the United Nations, maybe it's something that would have to wind up being considered because South Sudan, which gained independence in 2011, they had UN support for about the previous 20 years before getting that international recognition. East Timor, which is a tiny little country on like part of an island with... Indonesia and something else, they were a UN protected area for a long time. One of the reasons that Palestine has not gained international recognition to the extent of other places is because they lack the UN support because of the US having veto power on the Security Council. One of the reasons that Kosovo has not gained internet widespread international recognition is because Russia has veto power on the Security Council. So it's one of those things of how do you go about getting that international recognition after getting a strong enough amount of support? And I think honestly, you would have to look at having the UN do some kind of assistance, but as long as the U S has veto power, then that international recognition is probably never actually going to happen. I don't see any actual desirability in being recognized. What's re international recognition? They look at us and accept that we are independent. I don't need their recognition to be independent. I think we've strayed afield from my original question, and uh, it's been a great panel. Thanks, guys. Thank you.